Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to start out by talking about how pilots are positioned in an aircraft. In basically every aircraft we see today, the pilot is sat upright, facing forward as you would in basically any chair or seat that you would come across. This is done, I believe, for the rather obvious reason that the positioning is how we sit normally, it's what we're accustomed to. However, when it comes to aircraft, and more commonly aircraft at high speeds, that standard upright position is actually rather detrimental in one specific aspect, G-force. When engaging in high speeds or sharp maneuvers, the G-force a pilot experiences increases, and depending on the maneuver or speed, it can be dangerous or even deadly. For pilots, this is most often caused by increased vertical g-forces, which means that the force is parallel or aligned with the spine, forcing blood away or towards the brain. When blood rushes away from the brain, as is most common, the pilot can go from losing color in their vision at the less severe end to falling unconscious or flat out dying at the more severe end. In the opposite scenario, when the blood goes towards the brain, the pilot's vision can start to go red due to the excess blood in their head, and if intense or prolonged enough, it can cause ruptured vessels in the eyes or brain, which can cause permanent blindness or even death. G-forces can be extremely dangerous, so it stands to reason that pilots and aviation engineers would try to find ways to reduce the amount of G-forces pilots experience, both making it more likely that the pilot doesn't have any complications and that the pilot can perform more complex and strenuous maneuvers. Today, pilots have G-suits that help reduce the impact of G-forces on the pilot's body. Back in World War II, though, the subject of today's video had a different approach that has popped up every now and then, placing the pilot in the prone position. The plane we're referring to is the German-made Akaflieg Berlin B-9. Akaflieg Berlin, founded in 1920 in Berlin, is a non-profit student research group. Akaflieg Berlin is one of 13 similar groups in Germany, all of whom consist of university students and faculty who research aircraft, gliders, and aerodynamics in general. For about the first 20 years or so of their existence, Akaflieg groups existed in relative independence. Of course, when the Nazis came to power in the 1930s, this had to change, and the Akaflieg groups basically had no other choice. They were forcibly integrated into the Nazi Student Federation, and for the duration of World War II, the majority of their designing and research would be for military projects and military research. Just before the war in 1938, a research group called the Aerotechnical Group of Stuttgart, also simply known as the FFG Stuttgart, were in development of a prone position glider called the FS-17. This glider and pilot by proxy were supposed to be able to handle up to 14 Gs, a significant improvement over the 5 or so Gs a pilot could normally experience without much issue. A year later, in early 1939, the same group would advance the idea of a prone piloted aircraft and began design work on a powered aircraft with a speed upwards of 250 miles an hour. However, for some currently unknown reason, FFG Stuttgart would pass the project over to Akaflieg Berlin. Whether this was done for technical or political or military reasons is unknown, one can only speculate. Regardless, the design would continue in Berlin with an anticipated completion date of August 1942. The design request, which came from the Reich Ministry of Aviation, included the following stipulations. It had to have the pilot lying in the prone position. It had to have a high degree of safety. It had to have good visibility for the pilot. It had to have good speed and acceleration in a dive. It had to have good flying characteristics. And it had to be able to withstand up to 22 or 25 Gs. The resulting design prototype, completed behind schedule in early 1943 and first flown on April 10, 1943, was this. 
weighing in at around 2,000 pounds empty and 2,500 pounds gross, measuring in at 19 feet 11 inches long, 30 feet 10 inches wide, and 7 feet 7 inches tall, the B9 had a rather eye-catching design with that fully glass nose and canopy. As the pilot would be lying in the prone position, this was necessary as the pilot would naturally look downward. So to make it so that he wasn't just looking at the floor, the pilot was given that full glass nose and canopy to increase visibility, along with a little chin rest that he could use to help him look forward without straining his neck. The cockpit controls basically had to be built from the ground up, as a more standard layout would not work for a prone pilot. It was designed with distinctive left and right side controls, done so the pilot wouldn't have to cross his hands and complicate things. In addition, the pilot would use his feet to control the aircraft rudders and brakes. To maintain optimal forward visibility, engine and flight instruments were actually located behind the pilot, so as to not fill the front of the canopy with dials and gauges. To read them, he simply used a mirror. As the B-9 was made to withstand high G-forces, the body of the plane had to be durable enough to withstand up to 25 Gs. The B-9 would have a trapezoidal steel airframe covered with wood and canvas. The wings, made of wood and duralumin sheets, would be heavily reinforced internally to ensure that they didn't basically disintegrate during high-stress maneuvers. The rather boxy-looking engines, located under each wing, were Hurt HM500 air-cooled engines, each with just 103 horsepower. The engines would be connected to simple fixed two-blade propellers, a relative downgrade to the initially intended two-blade variable pitch propellers. Despite the original design from FFG Stuttgart estimating speeds up to 250 miles an hour, the B-9 would only have a maximum speed somewhere between 140 and 160 miles an hour. As for the rest of the aircraft's body, or the wheels and tails basically, it was pretty basic and normal, with your standard single tail and manually retractable wheels. There were no listed armaments, as this was just the testing prototype, but there were apparent plans to outfit it with hardpoints or racks for it to carry bombs. Between the initial test flight on April 10th, 1943, and October 28th, 1943, a total of 33 different test pilots would fly the B-9. On its second flight on April 14th, a pilot simply listed as L. Schmidt would have some kind of accident while piloting it. The severity of the accident was not recorded, nor was the damage it sustained recorded, but it was likely only minor damage. After this, for the remainder of the test flights, just a single accident would be recorded. Damage was minor, and three weeks later, testing on the B-9 would resume without issue. After October 28th, though, all testing on the B-9 would cease. Past this date, there were no more recorded flights for the B-9, and for all intents and purposes, the project was basically over. But why did the testing just suddenly stop? Was there some kind of catastrophic failure that ended up destroying the B-9? Were the test results so bad that it warranted the complete cancellation of the project? Or did test pilots really just hate the B-9 that much? Well, the answer to all of these is no. Apart from that one accident that resulted in minor damage, the plane went through testing basically unscathed and remained in good working condition. The overall test results were actually quite good and showed the potential advantages of a prone pilot plane. Overall results made the Germans think the B-9 would be well suited for a role as a traditional bomber, or more likely a dive bomber. In more standard aircraft where the pilots are seated as normal, the maximum G-force they can withstand is something like 6 Gs without any extra equipment for just a few seconds before they would fall unconscious and the average G-force somebody can endure before passing out is something like 4.6 Gs, but pilots are typically more accustomed to it through training and can handle a bit more as a result. In the testing for the B-9, they found that the pilots could withstand up to 8.5 Gs on the pull-up from a dive, and 6 Gs over several seconds in steep spiral climbs. 
If the pilots had been seated normally in these tests, they would have passed out rather quickly. In the B-9, though, the pilots reportedly did not experience any adverse effects despite the increased level of Gs they were experiencing. There is no record of them even experiencing color loss or tunnel vision. In many cases, the pilots didn't even know they were experiencing the level of Gs that they were. It should be noted as well that they only reached 8.5 Gs because the plane's top speed was just too low to hit anything higher than that. But clearly, the prone positioning had a significant positive impact. After the pilots conducted their flights, they were reportedly rather happy with the comfort and layout of the cockpit. There was a bit of a learning curve, to be sure, and pilots didn't really like the chin rest, but the chin rest was necessary to give their head the support it needed, and the pilots would generally become accustomed to it. After a few test flights, pilots could generally fly for around an hour and a half before they started feeling any discomfort. Some small adjustments were made to the controls at the recommendation of the pilots, but otherwise pilots were happy with the control scheme once they adjusted to it. The only real issue involved the pilot's legs. If the foot controls were not properly adjusted for the pilot's height, it would make the plane much harder to control. Additionally, several of the pilots had issues with their legs cramping mid-flight. This issue was rather easily remedied by having the pilots perform some simple leg exercises beforehand. All in all, though, comfort was certainly not much of an issue. So with the B-9 prototype surviving, its testing proving very successful, and with pilots liking it, what happened to it? Why did testing suddenly cease? Any information on exactly why seems to not exist, but I think the answer lies in what was happening in late 1943. On September 3rd, Germany lost its main European ally when Italy would surrender to Allied forces, meaning that Germany had to scramble to secure Italian territory and defend Germany's southern border basically on their own. Italy, for their part, or at least the portion of it that was controlled by the Allies, would declare war on Germany a month later on October 13th. On October 22nd, a major Allied bombing run on the city of Kassel resulted in a week-long firestorm that made tens of thousands of people homeless and killed thousands more. Meanwhile, over on the Eastern Front, Soviet forces were continuing their advance taking the Ukrainian city of Dnipro on October 25th. So, with all these things happening to Germany, a war on all sides of the German mainland and their cities being firebombed, what I think happened is that they abandoned the project to focus specifically on the defense of Germany. Of course, Hitler still wanted his superweapons like the V-2 rockets and eventual jet fighters, but Germany right now needed all hands on deck to produce weapons for the defense of Germany. Something like the B-9 was basically frivolous now. What good would a slow dive bomber with basically no upward visibility give them right now? They either needed more already established planes or their new super weapons to try and turn the tide of the war and prevent a German defeat. Of course, as we know, that didn't happen. Nazi Germany fell, and the B-9 project faded away. The plane itself was in all likelihood captured by U.S. forces, and as there are no further records of it, it was likely destroyed and scrapped in the following years. Alright, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching the video. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. This may sound kind of odd, but this plane actually reminds me of an old Hot Wheels car called Double Vision. I can't really explain why, and there's actually another plane that's much more similar to that, but it just does for some reason. Some kind of weird memory association going on in my brain in that one. But anyway, I hope you liked the video, I hope you watch my next one, and I hope you learned something from this one. So, see ya!